May of 1945 saw Captain John Dolobois of the U.S. Military Intelligence Division being assigned to the Central Continental Prisoner of War enclosure located at Mondorf Palace in his native Luxembourg. Captain Dolobois, together with four other Army personnel, had a mission at the prisoner of war enclosure. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson was to serve as the prosecutor for the United States at the Four Power International War Crimes Tribunal in Nuremberg. We were charged, says Captain Dolobois, with getting the information he and his staff needed. There was much to learn about the personalities and characteristics of the Nazi leaders. We knew little about the roles many of them played in the conspiracy with which they would be charged. Who gave the orders to execute prisoners of war? Who was responsible for the final solution? What did the people know about concentration camps, slave labor? That was our mission. Identify yourself. Fritz Sauker. Sir. Head of labor conscription. Former head. Julius Streicher. Publisher of... Sir, I can't pronounce it. Der Sturm. It's fifth. You thank us all Jews. You think I don't know that? Shut up. Hjalmar Horace Grilly Schacht, formerly president of the Reichsbank and minister of the economy. I do not understand why I have been accused here. I'm your jailer, not your lawyer. You'll get your day in court. Hans Fritzsche. Chief of Radio Operation in the Nazi Propaganda Ministry. Rudolf Hess, former Deputy Fuhrer. Hess, you... You are Kim von Ribbentrop. Nazi Foreign Minister. You. Colonel, this is Dr. Robert Lai, head of the German Labor Front. You're Albert Speer? Yes, sir. What's wrong with this man? <laughs> His mind is not what it used to He's be. He's an old drunk. It finally caught up with him. Can for a second. There's a very famous picture of the class of 1945, and you were there, but not in the <laughs> kind of in the picture, but you weren't. Well, I was. Um, one reason we were able to do our work at Ashcan is that there was no media hounding us, because the media worldwide had no idea where these high-ranking Nazis were. As I said earlier, there was a lot of speculation. People were guessing where they were, but nobody guessed that they were in Luxembourg. And, uh, and this is why Luxembourg had been chosen, because it was off the beaten path, small country, especially this, uh, this little town of Mundorf, which was a health resort, a spa. So nobody knew about it, and we were able to work without being interviewed by the press. It wasn't until the latter part of the summer when former inmates of concentration camps were released and were brought to Mundorf to recuperate uh, from their, excuse me, from their hardships and, and, a, and a punishment um, as slave laborers and as, as concentration camp inmates. When they were liberated, and they were brought to Mundorf at the expense of the Luxembourg government and were treated to the cure, drinking the mineral water, getting massages, and enjoying the park, uh, the park Anlage with the uh, beautiful flowers and trees and river. And so they were recouping their health. Well, it didn't take them long to find out who was on the other side of the barbed wire fence, that this were obviously the high-ranking Nazis. And a lot of these people would occasionally organize a little bit of a, a parade up the back of the compound, uh, which was uh, barred with a, a, a fence, barbed by a fence and camouflage nets. And, and they would sing the, uh, the horse wrestle song, 
with in Luxembourgish with their own ver uh, uh, version of the horse vessel song, which wasn't like the uh, some of it was pretty indecent and obscene, and they would drive the, the Nazis crazy because they'd be sitting on the veranda, and these Luxembourgers would walk by singing the horse vessel song, their version of it, and the Nazis would immediately jump up and go out of earshot inside the building or around the back of it so they wouldn't hear it. So the press did in time find out that the, the Nazis were in Luxembourg. So then we were inundated with uh, reporters from all over the world who wanted information and we'd have press conferences and tell the story. And I had to appear, especially for the Luxembourg media, because I could speak Luxembourgish and explain to Luxembourg people too that we were that these guys weren't getting the deluxe treatment inside the luxurious hotel. Uh, Time magazine was among the, the media elements, and they sent a photographer, and apparently uh, Colonel Andrews was either partial or he flipped the coin, but he gave them permission to take one picture. None of the press were allowed to take pictures inside. They could only be interviewed interview us on the outside. They weren't allowed to come in and interview the prisoners and, or talk to them or take pictures. But Time Magazine was allowed to take one group picture, which then appeared in the, if I remember correctly, November 7, 1945 uh, issue of Time Magazine. And they called it, uh, with tongue in cheek, the class of 1945. And they took a group picture of the entire a uh, bunch that we had. I think at that time there were 56 of them who were still left. Others had been released because they weren't important enough to keep any longer. Well, I was in charge of lining them up for this picture. And I was in a back row to give the photographer the signal when they were ready. And, and then it occurred to me that if I could just, uh, and it occurred to me much later, that if I had stood up in the back row, my picture would have been, along with the group, I would have been there, right, standing next to Grand Admiral Dönitz, who uh, was in the back row very modestly. And um, I stood next to him, but I ducked down after I gave the uh, cameraman the signal. And I've regretted it ever since, because if I had uh, just stayed there, my, my fi picture would have been along with the uh, the class of 1945, and that would have been a lasting. But I was, I was too much of a coward at that time uh, to take a chance of uh, having Colonel Andrews mad at me or something. So, but that issue of uh, Time magazine is still in the in the archives somewhere. Can be seen in this picture, in the upper rows, the bald-headed man at the top. And then there's a space, and then a very tall man. In between there, and hunched down, is Ambassador Delaboise. Thanks so much for this story.